So in this talk, I'm going to talk about um, colorectal cancer. How common is it? What are the risk factors for colorectal cancer? What can we do to prevent colorectal cancer? What are some of the signs of colorectal cancer? How do we screen for colorectal cancer? How do we treat colorectal cancer? And then the most important part, ask the doctor, doctor will you guys can try to stump me with questions? Um, so for 2021, the American Cancer Society estimates that we'll have about 104 new cases of colon cancer, uh, about over 45,000 cases of rectal cancer. It's the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States, and it's expected to cause about um, 52 to 53,000 deaths in 2021, so obviously a significant disease. This is kind of the anatomy, and I think this is a little bit helpful because it, it kind of tells or shows you all where the colon is. This is called the proximal or ascending colon. This is the transverse colon. Uh, they call this the splenic flexure where it turns and goes into the descending um, or distal colon. Down in this area is what we would call the sigmoid colon. And then when it crosses down into the pelvis, we call that the rectum. And that's important because we treat rectal cancer differently than colon cancer because of the drainage pattern the lymph nodes from the rectum drain into the pelvis, whereas the lymph nodes from the rest of the colon drain into what they call mesenteric lymph nodes that sort of sit in the soft tissue surrounding the colon. And then a couple other interesting things that we're learning about, uh, the, about colon cancer and treatment is that, um, for example, the right-sided colon cancers, which are the proximal ascending colon, those are more commonly associated with genetic inherited colon cancer risk and we're also recognizing that treatment is different. There's a few antibody targeted types of treatments that we use that work um, in the distal or sigmoid colon, but don't seem to have any impact or effect um, in patients that have a primary tumor that starts in the proximal ascending colon. So, so where the tumor arises from is uh, affecting our treatment even though in a sense the, the cells are the same, the, the, the majority of, of colorectal cancer is called adenocarcinoma. And that just refers to the fact that it's derived from cells that are producing mucus. And those are cells that line the intestine and they're called mucosal cells from the mucosal lining. So colon, uh, colorectal uh, risk factors, genetics, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and we can answer questions if anybody has those. Um, and that just basically means if you have, uh, if you inherited genes from your parents that put you at higher risk for developing colorectal cancer, that's certainly going to be an increased risk factor. Inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune disease where people get inflammation in the colon, and that inflammation seems to predispose those patients to a higher risk of developing colorectal cancer. Other factors include diabetes, diet, obesity, inactivity, smoking, and getting older. And I put this picture on here with of, of Chadwick Boseman because he um, was an actor that everybody probably knows. He died of colorectal cancer at age 43 fairly recently. And, and this is to make note of the fact that there's, it's noted that colorectal cancer is occurring in, in, in younger age people. And they're seeing this increase at about 2% per year. And they're not, no, no one's really sure why this is happening. But, um, but it is something that, um, for example, they're, they're they've decided to lower the age of screening from uh, 50 to 45. So, so we're seeing it in younger patients and I don't know that anybody really knows the answer as to why. Um, only about 5% of people who get colorectal cancer have a predisposition that they inherited. And two of the most common um, predisposing factors are Lynch syndrome and something called FAP, which is familial adenomic adenomatous polyposis. And through the Hearst Cancer Research Center, we obviously can do genetic counseling and we try to try to find these patients early on so that we start screening much earlier and the screening is much more intensive for those people who have a genetic predisposition. Other considerations that are important to talk about would be, can we reduce the risk of developing colorectal cancer? And there's a few things that are probably important. A healthy diet, Smoking, if, we, if people smoke, they should obviously stop. Decrease in alcohol intake, exercise, and then obviously screening. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But uh, with regard to diet, 
Um, it's controversial. If you go online and start trying to read these things, you, you can get all kinds of different opinions and different ideas. But I think a few things are, are pretty clearly established. One is that you can decrease your risk of colorectal cancer if you decrease your consumption of red and processed meat, as well as processed foods, and definitely decreasing sugar intake. And that may be related to the whole diabetes risk factor that we talked about earlier. And then it seems like increasing whole grains, increasing fiber, including foods like beans and peas, and increasing vegetables. And we've always told people to eat cruciferous vegetables, such as broccoli. And it's cruciferous because when you cut it, you see a cross in the middle. And of course, you got all kinds of other yummy stuff on here, like fish, peas, garlic. It makes me kind of hungry. Signs of colorectal cancer. Some of these are pretty obvious and some of them are not so obvious. So obviously if you get blood in your stool, you're going to talk to your doctor. Um, a black stool implies that there's digested blood. For colon cancer, that's usually going to be if it's a tumor that's up more proximal in the, in the um, ascending colon. And then very often patients just present feeling weak and tired. And we find that they're anemic and they have iron deficiency. And inevitably, a lot of those patients are losing blood somewhere in their intestinal tract. And that is often a, um, a presenting sign of colorectal cancer. Unexplained weight loss, we usually would see only in patients who have more advanced disease. Um, occasionally people just say they have some abdominal pain or maybe a change in their stool. We always talk about that uh, if a patient says they have um, like pencil stools, like all of a sudden the stools become much more narrow, then that would be a concern and recommendation to going to get uh, screened for colon cancer. So. So how do we screen for colon cancer? And the, the, the standard of care is visualization, which for the most part is colonoscopy. Though people have, in some situations, have said, well, maybe you could do a sigmoidoscopy. Um, you are gonna see just the first portion of the colon. You're not gonna get all the way to the end of the colon. So that's usually considered an incomplete visualization. There is something called virtual colonoscopy that's done with a CT scanner. They do in, um, they inflate, air into the intestine to help visualize it. So it, it does re still require some probing with a probe that inserts air. So, it, and it does have some risks. And so it's, it's still used, but I, I would say um, uh, there's no reason if you're gonna get a virtual colonoscopy to not just get a colonoscopy. And there are some situations where we'll use that. In this COVID time, people were worried about going in for screening. So there was a lot more use of stool tests and in the past, we always used guac-based fecal occult blood tests. More uh, recently though, um, there's immunohistochemical uh, or immunochemical testing, which we abbreviate FIT, F-I-T, fecal immunochemical testing. Um, and there's also something called uh, stool DNA testing. The Cologuard is the, is the one that is now FDA approved and that combines the FIT plus the stool DNA. And whereas with, colonoscopy, generally if you have a colonoscopy and there's, and there's no polyps and no other high risk factors, the, the recommendations are somewhere in, on the order of like five to 10 years, you would get a repeat colonoscopy. Um, if there's polyps, then it can be, uh, the recommendation can be more uh, sooner and it's really up to the, the uh, gastroenterologist who's doing the procedure. Um, but if people didn't get a colonoscopy and they wanted to use some of the uh, stool tests, then with the FIT test, uh, it's recommended that, that be done yearly. And for the Cologuard, it's recommended that, that be done every three years. The FIT test is relatively inexpensive. I think it's on the order of $25 to $30. The Cologuard test is on the order of five to $700. And, um, and the Cologuard test, you, you, you actually um, give them a, like, a, like a, a stool, like a bowel movement, whereas the FIT test, it's like a smudge. So. And recommendations for screening, uh, 45 is, is the age of uh, continuing until age 75, between 76 and 85, it sort of just depends. Um, and over 85, it was recommended that, that you probably don't need to screen at that point. Although I had a patient I saw just last week and he did the Cologuard test and it came back as positive. And so we went to the gastroenterologist and said, I have a positive Cologuard test, so I wanna get my colonoscopy. And they said, no. And I thought that was kind of surprising because they said, well, you're 85. He's a pretty healthy 85 year old. So I wasn't really sure what the deal was. And so, um, but, but anyways, I, I don't know that that's a hard and fast rule that they stop screening at age 85. 
Um, people who are high risk, like we talked about before, family history, uh, ulcerative colitis, those sets of things. Um, then uh, colonoscopy will sort of depend on what they find and uh, whether polyps. And there's a lot of guidelines with regard to how frequent, for example, Lynch syndrome patients should get screened. Um, with regard to treatment, I'm gonna just sort of gloss over this and we can talk about it more if people have questions, but for the most part, it's a fairly complicated disease to treat. It requires a multidisciplinary team. Most often the gastroenterologist is the person who is initially making the diagnosis on colonoscopy. They are then sending that to the pathologist who is conferring with the gastroenterologist. And then when appropriate, the surgeon is usually uh, involved right from the get-go. And then staging takes place where we get CT scans, determine whether or not the cancer has spread very far. More commonly now, we are uh, often uh, doing endoscopic ultrasound also, which Dr. Meisenman does here locally. Um, if it's in the rectum, radiation oncology will get involved. And um, of course, medical oncology is also involved. For uh, a lot of rectal cancers, we use neoadjuvant therapy, which means giving treatment before surgery. For advanced um, colon cancer, we will be considering um, sometimes in some situations giving chemotherapy before surgery as well. Um, I put on supportive services here because you guys all know how important that is as part of our team, which includes our nurse navigators, the whole Hearst Cancer Resource Center, our dietitians, our social support, um, our nurses, et cetera. Just a couple of terms I think are helpful to, um, to review. For colon cancer, usually the term is gonna be a segmental colectomy, which means they're taking out the tumor and they're taking out the lymph nodes in the mesentery, which is the, the floppy tissue around the, that segment of the colon. With regard to rectal cancer, uh, two approaches or, or two options. If the, if the tumor's not down too low or close to the anus, then a low anterior resection can be done and that's what part of the rectum is removed and the remaining part is reconnected to the colon. If it's down too far and the surgeon can't get, um, get clear margins, then they will have to remove the anus, the rectum, and the sigmoid colon with a, with a, a colostomy, which as it, most people know, means it's kind of like a hole that goes into a bag. So your stool goes into a bag, um, which is what a colostomy is. Laparoscopic is the term that refers to uh, the way surgeons can go in now with modern technology, they have cameras and they can make small incisions. And the benefit of that, of course, is that there's uh, um, a lot less uh, healing is much easier and people can get out of the hospital very, very quickly. Uh, the purpose of this slide is just to show that the rectum sits down in the pelvis and the lymph node drainage is different. And that's why we use radiation for rectal cancer, but we don't use radiation for colon cancer because the lymph nodes are flopping around up here in the bowel and you wouldn't be able to actually hit it with um, radiation. Uh, a couple other terms that we throw around a lot. One is neoadjuvant, which means before surgery, and one is adjuvant, which means after surgery. And this is with regard primarily to uh, systemic therapy, which very often is chemotherapy, although we are using antibody targeted types of therapy as well. And the mainstay for chemotherapy remains drugs that we've had around for a long time, which are fluorouracil, oxaloplatin, arinotecan. We do have targeted therapies that we use, something called bevacizumab, a drug called cetuximab, a pentumumab, and some other drugs such as regorafenib and encorafenib. And um, immunotherapy is used primarily in those patients that have it's called MSI high or microsatellite instability high, which is associated with um, Lynch syndrome. Some areas of exciting research, we are looking for targets and a couple of the targets that we see in colon and colorectal cancer are um, BRAF mutations, KRAS mutations, and HER2 new mutations. And I do have a couple of patients right now, for example, with a BRAF mutation, the KRAS mutation has always been sort of a poor prognostic feature, though 
there's some new drugs that are coming out that are going to be specific targets for KRAS mutations. So there is a lot of exciting research in the KRAS mutation area, which is very common. Occasionally, we'll see HER2 new mutations, and that allows us then to utilize all those drugs that we use more commonly in breast cancer, because that's where we see the majority of HER2 new mutated cancer. And then again, immunotherapy is used for microsatellite inst uh, instability, high um, or deficient uh, MMR um, uh, patients. And then there's a lot of research going into this, and I think it's pretty exciting. We don't, we're not quite there yet, but there's a lot of information about um, my, the microbiome that is um, on the internet. And a lot of that is based on research showing that this gut inflammation may be a precursor to why some people would uh, develop um, um, cancer. And so, so the whole idea of eating healthy, of eating fiber, of eating vegetable, it may be that we are decreasing gut inflammation and we're improving the microbiome. Um, other areas I think are pretty exciting um, are the fact that we can now assay for things such as circulating tumor cell DNA. And this is, I think, going to be huge in terms of deciding who needs to get chemotherapy if they have early stage disease. It also may be an, play an important role for, for monitoring and follow-up and determining whether people with metastatic disease, for example, are responding if it's not obvious. And then again, we're doing a lot of genomic um, and transcriptome analysis, looking for mutations that are potential targets. So those are some exciting areas of research that are being done.